Hi, my name is Christine Mattress from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, this is going to be the first in uh, my video lectures following University of Physics from OpenStax. Um, I have mostly just adopted the slides that they make available to instructors with a few minor modifications. Uh, my emphasis here is on getting videos out for my own students and not on production quality. Um, so it is what it is, and um, I'm posting them a bit so that they're available to students at other universities as well. Um, so we're going to start with scales. This first chapter goes over some big picture concepts that are important um, for understanding physics, and you probably have had exposure to many of these concepts already. Um, but in an intro physics class, you get them beaten into you because you absolutely have to start getting things right all the time. Um, getting these things wrong will often lead to no credit on, on, on homework problems and exam problems. So it's even though it seems simple, it's important to get it right all the time. Um, so this is an example from the textbook showing um, how scales are important. So this is actually uh, a picture of a galaxy. Um, but if you didn't know the scale, it is consistent with a lot of other pictures, and you wouldn't know exactly what you're looking at. And this is an example showing that you really need to know the scale to have some sense what you're looking at. Um, so this is about 10 to the 17th kilometers. Um, when we cite things like that, we talk about an order of magnitude. Um, and when we say that, that we are um, working with an order of magnitude, the specific term that we are referring to is this number here, the number in the exponent. Um, and we talk about how it's important to get orders of magnitude right, um, because if you do not have the order of magnitude right, then your answer is, can be wildly wrong. Um, so if someone tells you that it, it's going to take 10 minutes to walk to the store, that's not such a big deal. You don't mind walking to the store. But if someone tells you that it's going to take uh, a thousand minutes to walk to the store, you don't want to go to that store. You want to go to a different store. Um, and these are different pictures as well that you can see showing orders of magnitude. The, the first one is actually showing you uh, individual atoms. So if you look here, you can see the atoms in uh, inside of uh, um, a sheet of gold, um, and we are able to see things now that small. Um, and so this tells you the order of magnitude is around 10 to the negative 10. When we use orders of magnitude, we tend to be a little sloppy about the first number that comes out there. So we would tend to say that 5 times 10 to the negative 10 has an order of magnitude about 10 to the negative 10. And you know, we might also say that 8 times 10 to the negative 10 does, although you could also say that has this, uh, an order of magnitude of 10 to the negative 9, because it's about, it's approximately 10 to the negative 9, too. The second one is uh, phytoplankton, and this scale is 10 to the negative 6. So here, the second scale is already uh, 10 to the 4th or 10,000 times larger than the first picture. And then you go to the third picture, and this is galaxies. And this one actually doesn't give an order of magnitude. Uh, 300 million light years. I don't think very much in light years. So uh, I'm going to guess it has the same order of magnitude as the previous one, 10 to the 17th. So uh, when we're comparing these sizes, it's easier to compare the orders of magnitude than the actual numbers, because it doesn't really matter if those galaxies are 10 to the 23rd times li larger than the phytoplankton, or 2 times 10 to the 23rd. Those galaxies are a lot larger than the phytoplankton. And so often we talk about when you're uh, when you're doing homework problems, you want to make sure that you have to say check your orders of magnitude. Um, 
and this is sort of on par to saying, think about whether or not your answer even makes sense. If you tell me that uh, it takes you, uh, that it takes you 30 minutes to get into school every day, I'm going to believe you. But if you take, tell me it takes 30 days, I don't. Um, Okay, this figure did not actually get reproduced well from the um, from the textbook, um, but this is showing you know rough orders of magnitude the different things. So ten to the negative fifteenth is about the size of a proton, um, and you can go up here ten to the uh, negative seventh is the diameter of a typical virus. Um, most people are on the order of of a meter. Um, staying 10 to the zero. Um, I can confirm that. I have a, well, I have a seven-year-old who's about um, four feet, and I have a three-year-old who's about three feet. So yeah, my three, almost four-year-old is about one meter. That's true. Um, all the way up to 10 to the 21, the diameter of the Milky Way. Um, and you can see similar things for masses. 10 to the 22 kilograms is the moon. Um, the, if someone asks you how heavy your, your groceries are, if you tell me something that's on the order of tens, your grocery bags are tens of kilograms, I'm probably going to believe you. That might be heavy for a single grocery, 10 kilograms is heavy for a single grocery bag, but all of them probably are. Um, but if you tell me that they're 200 kilograms, I, that's a lot. Um, so when you're thinking about your answers, I want you to not just, you, you're not, in physics, you can't just plug and chug. You have to think about whether it makes sense. So um, if you guys are not used to working in SI units, which is what we work with all the time in physics, you should be thinking about how you convert it to something you are comfortable thinking in. Um, one of the things that I love doing is giving units in um, familiar heights. So for instance, when my now seven-year-old was learning how, um, how tall things were, I would give him, um, I would give the height of building in, buildings in the heights of his father. Um, and when we uh, had to talk about social distancing under COVID, I told him, you know, how do you tell a kid to stay six feet away, stay one daddy away from other people. Um, I, and I like making units named after myself because um, it's fun. Another big thing to think about is units. Um, so now that you are in a physics class, every single answer that you write down for a problem should have units. With a few exceptions that there are in fact some unitless quantities, um, but you want to think very carefully and make sure before you write an answer down on a problem that has no units, that it is actually a unitless answer and that that is the correct thing. Because if an answer should have units and your answer does not have units, your answer is wrong. So how tall am I? I am, I am five tall. What does that even mean? It doesn't mean anything without a unit. So um, yeah. Here's this, um, and, and it has to be the right units. So uh, my older son, um, when he was just beginning to grasp uh, these concepts, you know, how much did he eat? He ate like five meters of food. That doesn't make any sense. Your units, you have to have units and your units have to make sense. If you're giving me a distance, you should give me a distance that has units of length, some unit of length. Um, and, and you actually can drive your professor nuts unless they specify units. So if I tell you, you know, if I ask you for the distance, um, the distance between Knoxville and Memphis, you can give the answer to me in picometers. If I didn't tell you, you have to give it to me in kilometers. It will make grading more annoying. I will probably start specifying the units you should give your answer in. Um, but if I don't tell you, I mean, you could give it to me in miles or um, <clears throat> feet. It would be inconvenient, but it would be right. 
Um, and these units, the units that we use also have some history um, and, and they're very carefully chosen. Um, we, you know, often you go back to the original definitions and they are somewhat um, less precise, shall we say, but as we've tried to standardize things, um, we have gotten more and more precise definitions of the units. So for instance, here you can see uh, a picture of an atomic clock. Um, so we now actually have the fundamental unit of time defined as, um, as the vibration of a, a particular vibration of a cesium atom. And how I forget how many it is, um, but it lets us keep time to within one microsecond per year, um, because that, that is a fundamental quantity that is fixed by nature. Um, so that lets us do higher precision measurements. And then when we're talking to each other, when scientists are talking to other scientists, um, and when we're trying to work things out and be very precise, this makes sure that we're more or less all speaking the same language. Um, and here, you know, the, the meter used to be defined by these sticks of metal that um, sat in a vault somewhere. The problem with that is that, well, first of all, a physical object can get damaged fairly easily, um, and, and that's why they had to sit in a safe. Um, but the other thing is that metals expand and contract depending on the temperature. So if you have your meter defined as the length of some particular bar, your meter changes with temperature. That is not a property that you would like to have in your fundamental unit. So what we do now is that we actually define a meter by, um, by how far light travels in a vacuum. Um, and this is, another, um, this is another thing where we're defining it as a fundamental quantity in nature to make sure that we can actually have a very precise definition. Um, Here you see different um, different definitions of mass. So again, the mass definition, the mass mass used to be a kilogram used to be defined by a chunk of metal somewhere. Um, but now you can um, you can these are a couple of things considered to be standard um, mass. Um, it, and we're always working on refining this. So if we find some flaw in whatever we have defined our fundamental units to be, um, what we do is that we try to refine it and improve it. Um, and another key concept is models. So you hear this tossed around a lot, but when we are working in science, we have a very precise um, definition of both a model and a theory. A model is actually that refers to something where we're trying to describe the physical world mathematically. Um, and that is most of what we do in physics is try to describe the physical world mathematically. Um, and a model is when we have a mathematical description, but it's not so fundamental that it is, that we think that it is the, it, as a, roughly as good as we can get when we think that something is super fundamental, like um, Einstein's theory of, of relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, we give it the, the name theory. Something which is a theory is a really, really, really good model that has stood the test of time and has, test, has managed to live through all of our experimental verifications. It's confirmed as far as we can tell. But because sci as scientists, we're always working on poking holes in our own work. Um, we always try to disprove prior work. So we always allow the possibility that our current picture of the world is wrong. Here's an example of a model. Um, the Bohr model of the uh, electron had, of the, uh, of atoms had electrons orbiting the nuclei. Um, and it had circular orbits. This was a massive improvement over the um, prior model, which was called the plum pudding model, where they were just sort of electrons were stuck inside the, uh, the goo of positive charges. Um, but it was eventually superseded by, uh, uh, by quantum mechanics and a quantum mechanical picture of, um, of the atom. And I think that also shows how, you know, we have these models, they can be rather transient. They also can be very useful, even if they're not, if they're not right in all circumstances. 
So the, we often start you with something like the Bohr model of the atom because it's much easier to understand. And then we work you towards the more complicated subjects. And we're gonna be doing that actually throughout most of the semester. We're gonna talk to you about Newton's theory of gravity. And it is true that Newton's theory of gravity has been superseded by Einstein's theory of gravity. Newton's theory of gravity works really, really well. And it works really well on, on masses from about 10 to, the, 10 to the negative six kilograms all the way up to like 10 to the 17. Um, but it does have some failings. So when we start looking at the extremes, when we start looking at really massive objects, we see that Newton's theory of gravity starts to fall apart. It doesn't describe everything. Nevertheless, it's really useful. And most of the time, you don't need the complicated math that you come across in Einstein's theory of gravity. So, um, so we start you with Newton's theory of gravity. And that's not to say that these things are wrong. It's that we're working, we're building up towards things. And this is where all of these concepts meet. So you need to have a high enough, you need to understand scales because you also need to understand how accurate your model needs to be to do the job at hand. Um, and often you work with something that isn't perfect because it means that you can actually solve problems. Um, because when you are trying to figure out where, a, where the soccer ball you kicked is gonna land, you really don't need to consider corrections due to the warping of time space from its mass. And this gets at a different concept, which is accuracy versus precision. So um, here you can see, you may, you may have come across this before. This one here shows high accuracy. So the correct answer, the, the answer that you are trying to get here is, oh, this is, the answer you're trying to get is the middle of the bullseye. So on average, these, um, these different measurements are gonna give you the right answer, um, but they're scattered. And this collection of dots is going to give you the same answer over and over and over again, but it's actually not the right answer. Um, and that, that's giving you a systematic shift. And you guys will cover a little bit more of this in lab as well, where you're going to talk about um, how you do uncertainties. Because when we, um, when, whenever we're comparing these models to um, to data, we, we really want to consider the uncertainties. Everything in science is about uncertainties because we're always um, trying to test our models and improve our understanding.